The 2024 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to American John Hopfield and Canadian Jeffrey Hinton for fundamental discoveries and inventions underlying machine learning using artificial neural networks. This decision by the Nobel Committee may seem unusual, as their contributions are more in the realm of mathematics and computer science rather than physics. But since there are no Nobel Prizes for mathematics or computer science, it made sense to recognize their significant achievements through this award. Acknowledging the work of these scientists was indeed well-deserved, as their developments in the late 20th century paved the way for today's boom in neural networks and machine learning technologies. Nowadays, neural networks generate images, write texts, compose music, and perform many other tasks. While this is fascinating, it is merely the tip of the iceberg. Neural networks are powerful tools for processing colossal amounts of data, volumes so large that traditional methods would be nearly impossible. They can sort and compare data, detect patterns, identify anomalies, and make predictions. Tasks that were once the sole domain of the human brain, but now with the speed and efficiency of a computer. Hopfield's Nobel Prize-winning invention is the Hopfield Neural Network Architecture, which allows for the recognition of digital patterns, such as identifying objects that have been previously loaded into the neural network's memory, a process often referred to as machine vision. Human vision excels at object recognition. For instance, when we see an image of an apple, we can almost always identify it as an apple, even if it's an unusual color, shape, or if the image is of poor quality. Our brain compares the new image to all the apples we've previously seen, deciding how much it resembles an apple. And if the similarity is high enough, we conclude that it's an apple, even if some details are unfamiliar. Computers don't naturally work this way. Concepts like similar or not similar are not innate to them. A traditional computer can recognize an apple only if the image matches exactly with one of the stored images. Any small discrepancy would lead the computer to conclude that it's not an apple. Teaching a computer to reason in terms of similar and not similar is the job of neural networks, particularly the Hopfield network. The Hopfield network is composed of many nodes or neurons, each connected to every other neuron via links known as synapses, an analogy to the structure of the human brain that neural networks aim to imitate. Neurons can take on fixed values of minus one or one, while each synapse has a weight which can be any positive or negative number. The key to the neural network's function is a quantity equal to the product of the neurons, values, and the weight of the synapse connecting them. For example, if both neurons are in the same state, such as one and one, or minus one and minus one, and the weight of the connection is positive, then the product will also be positive. If the weight is negative, the product will be negative. The product will become positive if the neurons are in opposite states, for instance, plus one and minus one. More precisely, in a Hopfield network, they work with an opposite value, which will be negative for a positive connection when the neurons have the same values and positive for opposite neuron values. This value is also called the energy of the connection. It is assumed that the Hopfield network will be in an optimal state if the total energy of the connections between all the neurons in the network is at its minimum. You can bring the network to an optimal state with minimum energy in two ways. First, by adjusting the synapse weights to match the neuron values. And second, by changing the neuron values to match the synapse weights. In the Hopfield network, both methods are used. The first during the data upload into the network, also known as the learning mode, and the second during the network's analysis of an image it needs to recognize, known as the retrieval mode. Let's say we want to teach our network to recognize the number two. First, we'll generate an image of this number using neuron pixels. Those that should be illuminated are assigned a value of plus one, while those that should remain dark are assigned a value of negative one. Let's call this set of neuron values x zeros. We'll load our image into the network and optimize it, adjusting the weights so that the network's energy is minimized. We'll call the set of weights that minimizes the energy for x zero, omen zero. This omen girl will essentially store information about the images the network has learned for future use. Now, let's load a test image into the network, translated into the language of neuron values, let's call this set x1, and calculate the network's energy for x1 and omega zero. 
The closer this energy is to the value for x0 and omega0, the more similar the image is to what we taught our network to recognize. By setting a similarity threshold, we can ensure that our network will identify images that are similar but not identical to the original, just like our brain does. Moreover, a trained neural network can restore the original appearance of a damaged image. For example, starting with a partially obscured image and ending with a recognizable complete one. This is done using a straightforward algorithm where we check at each step how the network's energy changes when a random neuron state is reversed. If this leads to a reduction in energy, we fix the network in the new state and move to the next neuron. If the energy increases, we simply move to the next neuron without making any changes. The most interesting part is that we can load several images into a Hopfield network, and it will be able to determine which one the input image resembles the most. That is, it can not only recognize or restore a damaged image, but also identify which of the stored objects is being shown. Two minima will form on our curve, and the task of identifying the object will boil down to determining which minimum the input image is closer to. This process can be computationally expensive, which is why the practical implementation of the Hopfield algorithm, invented in 1982, only became possible much later. But it does indeed work. Well, almost always. Almost always, because the Hopfield network soon encountered a problem with recognizing similar images. Let's take, for example, the numbers 7 and 1. They are quite similar. Both are two lines connected at a specific angle. In fact, you could draw 7 and 1 in such a way that even the human eye would struggle to identify which number is shown. For a neural network, this would be even more difficult due to the specifics of the data processing algorithm proposed by Hopfield. Indeed, let's say we ask our neural network to recognize the digit in this image and restore it to a more familiar form. Overall, it looks more like a 7, but it is also quite similar to a 1. And so on the network's energy graph, two nearby minima form. Yes, the minimum corresponding to 7 will be deeper, and theoretically, the neural network should complete its analysis at this minimum. However, in practice, this may not always happen. While restoring the image, the neural network may get trapped in a false local minimum corresponding to one and be unable to escape because our algorithm forbids any changes that increase energy. In 1985, Jeffrey Hinton and Terry Sejnowski came up with a solution to this problem. Incidentally, why only Hinton received the Nobel Prize for their joint work remains a mystery to me, but let's not get distracted by that. Hinton and Sejnowski proposed a way to pull the network out of false minima by using random shakes, chaotic shifts of the network from its current position, say from x to x plus del x or x mys del x, from which it can start the search for a minimum anew. This could indeed help the network escape local minima and head toward the global one. However, if these shifts are truly random, they could also throw the network from the global minimum into a local one. In simpler terms, the shifts shouldn't be entirely random, but should have a certain internal logic, one that makes it more likely to shift toward the deep global minimum rather than to the smaller ones. This logic was found in statistical physics, specifically in one of its key formulas known as the Boltzmann distribution. This formula describes the probability of finding a particle with a certain potential energy in an ensemble of many particles at a given temperature. This probability is proportional to the following value. The higher the energy of the particle we are looking for, the less likely we are to find it. Or, in other words, the lower the concentration of such particles in the ensemble. This formula perfectly explains, for example, why the concentration of molecules in the atmosphere decreases with altitude. If we substitute the potential energy of a molecule at height h into the Boltzmann formula, we get exactly what we observe in practice. It also helps explain why, with increasing altitude, the concentration of heavier molecules, like nitrogen and oxygen, decreases faster, while the relative concentration of lighter molecules, such as hydrogen, increases. But we digress. What's important is that the Boltzmann distribution organizes randomness in just the way we need, since transitions to a state with higher energy are less likely than transitions to a state with lower energy the greater the increase in energy from the transition, the lower the probability. 
In general, the algorithm can be described as follows. We first plan some purely random shift of x, then calculate how the energy changes as a result of that shift. Then, using the Boltzmann formula, calculate the probability of making such a transition, and then check, perhaps using a random number generator from zero to one, whether this probability is realized. If yes, we make the transition. If no, the system remains in its previous state. And we can be confident that after enough of these shakes, our system will arrive at the true minimum state, corresponding to the image we wanted to retrieve. Of course, with this approach to the Boltzmann distribution, the temperature in the equation loses its physical meaning, becoming just a kind of scaling constant. But even this constant found a useful application. The higher the temperature, the greater the probability of transitioning to a higher energy state. And the lower it is, the less likely such transitions are for our neural network. Therefore, at the start of the algorithm's execution, the temperature is set higher to increase the system's freedom and then gradually decreased so that when the system reaches the region of the global minimum, it becomes harder for it to exit. This algorithm is called simulated annealing. By analogy with the annealing process in metals, which also involves heating and then gradually cooling. The goals are similar. Annealing metals is used to harmonize their crystal lattices and eliminate defects and internal stresses. While in the case of neural networks, we eliminate the false minima defects characteristic of the Hopfield network. In general, the device proposed by Hinton and Sejnowski aimed at solving the problem of recognizing similar images is called a Boltzmann machine in honor of the author of the formula at the heart of the algorithm. However, as is often the case, especially with neural networks, it turned out that Hinton and Sejnowski's invention is capable of much more than just curing the Hopfield network of one of its early problems. Introducing randomness into neural network operations allowed them to do things no one initially expected. For example, Boltzmann machines can perform clustering of data arrays, identifying groups of items based on certain characteristics defined by the network itself. These could be, for example, fruits, round objects, or sports equipment. From here, it's just a short step to giving the neural network the ability to generate new images based on existing ones, say, creating an image of a fantastic, non-existent fruit. So in the end, we not only taught the neural network to recognize patterns, but also to analyze them, and based on this analysis, create entirely new objects, essentially endowing neural networks with creativity, which not long ago seemed like pure science fiction. That said, the story of how neural networks generate new content goes beyond today's discussion and beyond the focus of our channel in general. After all, as I mentioned, the topic of neural networks is more about mathematics than physics, though we do sometimes venture into adjacent areas like in this video. By the way, we have another video coming soon on the intersection of physics and mathematics, one on the principles of quantum computing, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything interesting. I'd also appreciate it if you supported the channel by becoming a sponsor, either here on YouTube or on Patreon or Boosty. A link to the latter should appear in the top right corner of your screen now. That's all for today. Take care, dear friends, and see you in our next videos.